Imagine it's the early 1890s, and you're traveling to Chicago for the World Fair to celebrate the 400th anniversary of the arrival of Christopher Columbus in the New World. You arrive and find that your accommodations have fallen through. While trying to figure out your plan, a handsome mustached man wearing a bowler hat approaches you and offers you up a spot in his home, within view of the fairgrounds. You follow the man and find that his residence takes up nearly an entire city block. It holds shops on the first floor, and the man explains that he has short-term and long-term residences available in his home, so you take the kind man up on his offer. As you follow him to your room, you notice that the layout of the building is strange. There are seemingly doors to nowhere in the building, as well as a labyrinth-like maze to get around. In the middle of the night, you leave your room, searching for a bathroom, and as you step through a doorway, you fall down a shaft and into a small enclosed room no bigger than a coffin, where the ceiling closes over you. You slowly suffocate to death in this small room. You've just become a victim of the famed U.S. serial killer H.H. H. Holmes and his notorious murder castle. As always, this episode of A Brief History contains graphic content and may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Holmes was born in New Hampshire on May 16, 1861, as Herman Webster Mudgett. Holmes's parents, Levi and Theodate, were descendants of the first English immigrants in the area and had two children prior to Holmes, as well as two following his birth. Levi Mudgett worked as a farmer, trader, and house painter, basically picking up odd jobs where he was able to. It is reported by some questionable sources that Holmes, like many serial killers, was abused by his father, but people who knew the Mudgetts as a family have never provided proof or evidence of this abuse. Holmes graduated high school from Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire, and was married to Clara Loverling soon after graduation. The couple had a son, Robert, in 1880 while still living in New Hampshire. After the birth of their son, Holmes enrolled in the University of Vermont, but left after a year, finding that he was unhappy with the school. Two years later, Holmes attended the University of Michigan in the Department of Medicine and Surgery. Holmes eventually graduated and apprenticed under a number of professors and doctors who focused on anatomy and dissection, leading to Holmes's interest in the human body and what it could be put through. Later in his life after his arrest, Holmes admitted that during his time at university, he used multiple cadavers to defraud life insurance companies, adding to the list of his crimes. People who knew Holmes and his wife Clara claim that they witnessed him treat her horribly and violently throughout their relationship. After his graduation from medical school, Clara moved back to New Hampshire and later wrote that she knew little about Holmes after she had left him. Around the same time, Holmes made a move to New York and faced rumors that he had been seen with a little boy who had disappeared. Holmes claimed that the boy had left to go home and Holmes quickly left to move to Pennsylvania to avoid more suspicion, while only creating more. While in Pennsylvania, Holmes bounced from job to job before settling on working in a drugstore in the heart of Philadelphia. While working as a chemist in the drugstore, a young boy died after receiving and taking medication from the store, again putting the heat onto Holmes. Holmes immediately denied any knowledge or involvement in the death of the boy and suspiciously left the city. This time, when moving, Herman Webster Mudgett changed his name to Henry Howard Holmes to try and avoid his past crimes catching up to him in his new life. In 1886, Holmes committed bigamy by marrying a woman named Murda Belknap, while still married to his previous wife, Clara Loverling. Holmes eventually filed for divorce from Clara after his new marriage, and claimed infidelity on her part but could not prove his case. It is also widely thought that Clara had no idea of the divorce suit and it was never finalized. Despite this, Holmes continued his life with Murda and had a daughter with her in 1889 while living in Wilmette, Illinois. Even later, in 1894, 
Holmes married yet another woman, Georgiana Yoke, while still married to his two previous wives. In 1886, Holmes had finally moved to the Chicago area, where he found employment at a drugstore owned by a woman named Elizabeth Holton and her husband on the corner of South Wallace Avenue and West 63rd Street. Holmes was a stellar employee and eventually purchased the store from the Holtons. After the purchase of the store, Holmes also purchased an empty lot across the street and began construction in 1887 for a two-story mixed-use building. The first floor of the building would be host to a number of shops and retail spaces, including a brand new drugstore for Holmes himself. The second floor would be apartments. Holmes ran into a number of issues during the initial construction, mostly from Holmes himself failing to pay for materials or labor from the contractors and companies he had hired. In the early 1890s, Holmes added a third floor telling his investors that he was going to use the floor as a hotel to capitalize on the upcoming World Fair. The hotel portion of the building was never completed, and Holmes was found to be hiding materials and furniture in hidden rooms and passageways in the sloppily laid out building to hide that he hadn't actually paid for the items. During construction of the building, Holmes replaced construction crews working on it frequently, and never provided contractors with his full vision, wanting to keep the secrets to himself. Over the course of the construction, he added soundproofed rooms, mazes of hallways, doors that led to nowhere, staircases that led to nowhere, a crematorium in the basement, and chutes on each floor that led straight to the basement, where he had vats of acid and quicklime available to dispose of the bodies he was collecting. During inspection after his arrest, officers found even more torturous spots in the building, including rooms with hinged walls and partitions, secret passageways, and rooms connected to pipelines to be used as gas chambers. Many of these rooms would lock immediately upon closing the door and were only able to be opened from the outside, making many of the rooms in the building the final resting place of some of its victims. One of the first victims attributed to H.H. Holmes was that of his mistress, Julia Smith. Julia lived in the building with her husband and was working as a clerk at the jewelry counter in the pharmacy Holmes owned. Julia's husband found out about her affair with Holmes and moved away, leaving her and their young daughter behind with Holmes. Julia and Holmes continued their relationship until both Julia and her daughter disappeared on Christmas Eve in 1891. It is unknown what happened to the two women. Two more women who were likely linked romantically to Holmes and worked in the building also disappeared and are believed to be victims of Holmes and his murder hotel. There are many more instances of strange disappearances surrounding Holmes and his murderous residence, and eventually Holmes would confess to 27 murders in total. But it is thought that Holmes could have murdered up to 200 individuals in his lifetime. In the summer of 1894, insurance companies across Chicago were attempting to prosecute Holmes for arson. And to avoid any charges, Holmes left Chicago. Later that same summer, Holmes was arrested on charge of selling mortgage goods in Missouri. Holmes was bailed out almost immediately, but not before making the acquaintance of a fellow prisoner named Marion Hedgepith. Holmes planned with Hedgepith to con an insurance company out of $10,000, which would translate to over a quarter of a million dollars today. The plan was for Holmes to take out a life insurance policy on himself and then fake his death. Hedgepeth was offered $500 for his participation in finding a trustworthy lawyer to perform the con. A lawyer was eventually found and the plan was enacted. The insurance company, however, noticed how suspicious his death was and refused to pay out the policy. In likely his smartest move, Holmes didn't press the claim, but stupidly decided to try the scheme again, this time faking the death of his close friend Benjamin Pitzel, who was used as a right-hand man in Holmes in many of his fraudulent crimes. Pitzel agreed and his wife was to claim the insurance money to split with the other members of the con. It was Holmes' job to find a cadaver that would resemble the man closely enough to pass the fraud off as true. But in true Holmes fashion, the body he found would be none other than the body of his friend Benjamin Pitzel, 
who was knocked unconscious by Holmes with chloroform and then set on fire with benzene. Holmes later claimed that Benjamin, though unconscious, was still alive when the fire set, though forensic evidence showed that chloroform wasn't given until after Pitzel had perished, likely to help fake the suicide and lead the police away from Holmes as a murderer. After the death, Holmes manipulated his friend's wife into giving him three of her five children to keep in his custody. Holmes frequently lied to the woman about her husband's whereabouts and death, as well as the whereabouts of her now three missing children. Holmes later admitted to killing two of the children by putting them into a trunk and locking them inside, before attaching a hose from a gas line to the trunk to asphyxiate the two children. The nude body of the young girls were buried in the cellar of Holmes's rental residence in Toronto. A detective from Philadelphia who was investigating Holmes and trying to find the three missing children eventually found the decomposed body of the children in the cellar, stating, The deeper we dug, the more horrible the odor became. When we reached the depth of three feet, we discovered what appeared to be the bone of the forearm of a human being. Holmes was arrested in Boston on November 17, 1894, after being tracked by the Pinkertons, a famed private detective agency. Holmes was held on an outstanding warrant for the theft of a horse in Texas, but authorities were suspicious of Holmes and his potential involvement in other crimes. After finding the bodies of his friend's children, Chicago police began investigating his murder hotel, affectionately referred to as the Castle, due to its large size and the style of the building. There were many claims made about the castle, but there was apparently no evidence found in Chicago that could have led to a conviction for Holmes. In late 1895, Holmes was put on trial for the murder of Benjamin Pitzel and was found guilty and subsequently sentenced to death. At this point, it was also found there was strong evidence linking Holmes to the murder of Pitzel's children as well. After being convicted for the murder of Pitzel, Holmes confessed to an additional 27 murders in Chicago, Indianapolis, and Toronto. Though some of the victims he claims to have killed were found alive and well elsewhere, Holmes also confessed to an additional six attempted murders. Holmes was contradictory in a lot of his statements, from claiming to be completely innocent to then claiming he was possessed by the devil. It was, and still is, difficult to look at Holmes' statements and pull the truth from the lies. Until his execution in the spring of 1896, Holmes remained calm and collected while facing the inevitability of his death. As a last request, Holmes asked that his coffin be contained in cement and buried at least 10 feet deep to discourage grave robbers from stealing his body and using it for dissection eerily similar to the crimes Holmes may have committed himself. Holmes's requests surprisingly were followed, and his coffin was filled with cement and also covered with cement. Despite this, in 2017, Holmes's body was exhumed to confirm that it was actually H.H. H. Holmes in the grave, following rumors that he had bribed his way out of his execution, and his body was simply replaced with a lookalike. It was confirmed that it was Holmes' body in the grave. Holmes was hanged at Moya Mensing Prison for the murder of Benjamin Pitzel. During his hanging, Holmes' neck did not snap, and instead the man was slowly strangled to death for 15 minutes, while his body hung, twitching until he died. Holmes' death was pronounced 20 minutes after the sentence was carried out. Just a year prior to his death, Holmes' castle was gutted by a fire, after witnesses saw two men enter the back of the building in the late evening. Half an hour after they entered, they were witnessed leaving the building and running away. Several explosions caused the castle to be ravaged by fire. The building miraculously survived and was actually used for several more years before being torn down in 1938 to make way for a post office. If Holmes's story sounds familiar, it's because his story has been used as inspiration in many pop culture moments. The 1974 novel American Gothic by horror writer Robert Bloch was a fictionalized version of Holmes's story. The fifth season of American Horror Story Hotel 
was inspired by the Deadly Hotel. And an episode in the second season of Supernatural also focused on the ghost of H.H. Holmes, this time abducting women from an apartment building that had been built next to the prison he was executed at. There are also claims that H.H. Holmes, due to the timing of his travels, may actually have also been Jack the Ripper. But this is just speculation and has never been proven. What crimes do you think Holmes actually committed? Was he responsible for over 200 deaths like some sources claim? Or was his victim count significantly lower than we may think? Due to his lies, exaggerations, and the loss of the castle in its entirety, we may never know the full extent of H.H. H. Holmes's crimes. But the fact remains that Holmes was a disturbed man who did kill people and swindled many people out of money as a con man. Thank you for watching this episode of A Brief History. Thank you to my patrons who support this series. I appreciate you more than you know. And a special thank you to Sim Queen, who so kindly built the exterior of the Holmes castle for me. Be sure to follow the link to her portion of this build in the description box below. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed so you catch the next one. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time.